So uh, welcome to the Future of Teamwork podcast, Suzanne. This is Dane. I'm the Huddle 3 Group CEO, and I'm really excited to have you here with us oh, today. Oh, it's great to be here, Dane. Thanks for inviting me. You bet. So we've, uh, we've met just recently, and you've got a fantastic story, which really captivated my attention from that early lunch I think we shared together. Could you tell me and the listeners a little bit more about, you know, your personal story, your business background? Yeah. So uh, the way I love to answer the question about business background is, is I'm a mother. So I've learned how to be a professional woman and be a mother at the same time um, and have my whole life work, which is the thing I'd say I'm most proud of. <laughs> so yeah. so I, I started off as a single mom and did a lot of work in the nuclear weapons field and then started to focus on the power of communication and teamwork and why transformation inside cultures is important. Because, of course, the United States shifted from having a weapons mission to a cleanup mission. And then I went and studied communication and eventually ended up having the incredible opportunity to be on the board and be the director of possibility of Lululemon Athletica when it was a baby company. I did that for 10 years and founded my own company, Light Your Leadership, and became an author. So I, I love being here. I love talking about the future of work, of teamwork, because I have four kids that are stepping into a whole new world, you know? Yeah. It's actually a big driver for me. And I know you and I have spoken about it, but the future of work, the future of teamwork, you know, your story, we're going to talk more about that today. My story, it, it, there's been so much meaning and so much purpose and so much connection um, with other humans through work. And we want that for this next generation and, and the ones that follow. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody, yeah. every human being really deserves to have meaningful work. Yeah. You know, it, no, I'm a big believer. It's like a fundamental human right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when you talk about your story from missile, nuclear missile programs to uh, athletic wear and, and now the leadership and coaching business, I mean, you've seen some, some very different work environments some very different teams at play. Yeah. So one thread that I'd say has been running through, let's say the 30 decades or more of my working life is that there is an evolution towards a more whole systemic way of working and a movement away from purely uh, broadcast hierarchical teamwork. And I, I've yeah. loved getting to be uh, one of the evolvers of that and to be in the impact of how great it feels to be part of a wonderful team, you know, and it doesn't happen every time. Uh, and yeah. it, it, it's something that people, I believe, it's a skill that they can learn to cause. Having a great team isn't an accident. It's an act of creating a vision and a possibility for that to happen. So I, I feel that's a big part of the future of teamwork is people knowing that they can cause it. It isn't just, you know, going to happen and they're either lucky. I love that. That's, that's exciting. It's empowering. Uh, and coming out of COVID and the pandemic, which has changed so much of the way that we work, I think it's brilliant that we're creating this call to action for people to, to, to take ownership of that, to actually cause teamwork to happen in, in the way that it should happen in their work environments. Can you, can you explain a little bit more about how you would define, you know, what, what good teamwork is, what that means to you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I'd say that at the core of a great team is this shared culture and language around their own self-leadership. So in the great teams that I've witnessed and the great teams that I've had the privilege of being on, I know that each member knows themselves and, yeah. and, and they have the ways to recover when they failed or when they're having an off day, they know how to reset. So from the very beginning, it starts with the self and then it radiates out to the team. So I'd say that, you know, a pure definition of teamwork would be it's a group of people that share the same goal. Yet I feel like to update it to where the world is now and the future of teamwork, it's not only the same goal, it's the language to fulfill on that goal 
and core values that they can use when they have difficult decisions to make or they need to strategize in a new way. And, and that's what I see a lot of younger people either have and they're thrilled or it's missing and they're sad, Yeah, you know? There's a lot of sadness, I think. You're seeing that. We've been talking about this great resignation, but the way you've described it there, having those values, having that language, the behaviors really in the team, people want that. People are really yearning for it today. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I was coaching the CEO of uh, a company about a month ago, and I asked him, you know, what's one of your most important goals? Because in light year, that's what we talk about most of the time is vision and goals and coming from future. And he said, it's, it's to be looking back at the team that I'm participating in and am building and having us be celebrating ourselves. I thought, how interesting. Yeah. You know, so he's, let's say, I guess he's probably in his 40s. He knows that he's spending more time right now with those people than his wife and his children. And, and he wants a way to acknowledge and love his wife and his children is to have the meaning in his teamwork matter and to be celebrating. Because the last thing a family member wants to yeah. hear is that their dad is bummed with people that he works with. And, you know, same for the women. That, that, that is really key. I know that my kids certainly beat me up sometimes for the time that I'm away from them or worse the time that I'm on my phone when I'm with them which I'm trying to eradicate uh it's it's a slow but steady process yeah um but you're right you know we spend a lot of time away from our families and loved ones and we spend a lot of time with these work colleagues but we're not always making great connections we're not always in teams that we can look back on and and celebrate and, and we should we I think we deserve it we owe it to each other yeah uh, the, the the concept of Looking back from the future, you just referenced that in, in the context of uh, Lightyear leadership, which we'll talk more to today. But uh, at the conference we were at last week, Dan Pink was talking about your future self when you're facing a decision that's tied to his world regret survey right now. But he was talking about when you're facing a decision in life, ask your future self, ask Dane or ask Suzanne plus 10 years what decision they would have made and how they would feel about it at the time. It's a really interesting concept. I think it's quite new in the world of work and, and in the world of teams. You know, I have seen some sports teams talk about, you know, let's talk about uh, how we're going to feel when we bring home the World Cup. There's a little bit of sort of visioning and, and belief that comes with that. But can you tell me maybe a little bit more about how you've used that with people you've coached, with teams that you're working with? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh a principle that we use in light year is a term called remembering the future, which seems a bit like an oxymoron, but it's this idea that that future self, that future team, that future outcome does know what it did. And similar to an old fashioned maze that you might find in the classifieds with the comics, if you start with the end in mind, as you know, many of our business leaders talk about, you can find your way through the barriers more easily. And the brain is a bit like a maze. So if it begins by remembering the success and the sensation and the feeling and the celebration and then works back to say, well, how did I do that? I, oh, how did yeah. I do that? There's more freedom. And I'm sure there'll be scientific research that proves that that's true. I have more uh, decades of anecdotal knowledge to know that we can and do remember our future. That's neat. Actually, it ties in a lot to some of my early sporting experiences too. You know, when you've played together and you have that affirmation of how you'll come through a hard time together, then the next time you're thrown into a hard time, you kind of know who to look for, who's going to play which role, how you're going to, how you're going to come together to get through whatever that advers adversity is. Yeah. Uh, and I must admit, I've, I've experienced it personally more on the sports field than in the workplace, but I'd love to see more of it in the workplace. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well... One of the things that that metaphor lends itself to is considering the times where we've been on teams and we're facing a challenge and knowing, like, one of the things I do, uh, you probably have some version of this at Huddle 3 also, is when something difficult is happening or challenging, I'll actually rename it and say, oh, that's light year kind of fun. Because, see, there's a way oh, where cool. we bond in challenge. Uh -huh. You know, we matter Absolutely. more in challenge. And, and, and if we can make that moment more sweet when it's happening, 
I've found my creative force stays more awake and alive than if I go into like a fear and doubt. Because it's those um, self-leadership, personal recovery skills that make the team great in challenge because we're like, oh, here we go. You know, it's time. Yeah. It's time to make the difference. And there's certainly going to be a fair amount of that over the next couple of decades. <laughs> Lots of challenge. Yeah. A lot of challenge. And in fact, I think coming out of this pandemic, I think you're seeing more teams that have that muscle memory. You know, they've come through some stuff there wasn't a playbook for, particularly people in the the HR, people and culture, talent side of mm. organizations. Um, they've they've kind of been thrown a lot of challenges all of a sudden with very little resource or experience to tackle it. And I'm I'm really intrigued to see some of the the leadership that's coming out of those functions and the innovation that's coming out of those functions and those people that lead those functions. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's that's an exciting phase for, for business. Yeah. I mean, here's here's a really small thing. Um, and I might have shared this with you earlier, but it's a very tangible thing. I was speaking with a colleague of mine uh, about the future of work and, and teamwork and, and what it's like for her as the head of people, as folks are given the choice to return to the office, how are they going to return to the office? Who's going to return when? How are they going to use that asset? And one of the things that she noticed is that people were coming back and keeping the status quo of where they had their parking spots. And she challenged it. She said, look, do we really want to have this hierarchy, hierarchy, <laughs> hierarchy like of it. directors only parking spots when indeed we're not here all the time? Do we bring yeah. forward some of these sort of like old ways of thinking or do we release them to a, a more um, holistic workplace that's, yeah. you know, and I thought, wow, if she's thinking about that, what else do we need to be looking at and challenging instead of just saying, oh, yeah, let's go back to normal. And, and I'd say that's the most important thing that we do, particularly in 2022, as we break out of this snow globe is say, well, what? Yeah. What do we leave? What do we take forward? What's brand new? Yeah, I, I love that. It's, there's almost a rite of passage or a ritual that can be created through doing that intentionally mm. in our teams too. Mm -hmm. We can kind of say, hey, we've, that's what we used to do. Here's what we changed through COVID. Let's, to, your, to your earlier theme of, of having the ability to cause the teamwork, let's cause the culture, let's cause the 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 small behaviors um to be the way that we need them to be in our teams going forward well for fun and 500 extra adventure points which is what we do at lightyear i have a question for you dane that i think could be yeah. fun. you just used the word um you know right or or you know celebrations we could have what's and you could use a sports analogy if you want well what's a, a right or a celebration that you've done with with a team that you you believe is really valuable because i i i hear that you're right as people do uh go into this new world how could we dedicate that in a new way so to be clear yeah. the question is what would be a great right of a team r-i-t-e it's, it's it's a fantastic question uh, and thank you for asking it um if I was to think back on what we've come through just recently and what I'm seeing my teams really embrace, mm -hmm. I think the right is, and this, this sounds a little bit silly, but I think it is actually having the ability to craft their own playbook. Mm. And I think it's having the ability to say, traditionally we've worked in businesses that have been a little bit top down in telling us, what they want the culture to be, what they want the purpose to be, what our values are, how we do work. But, but now there's this opportunity to tell a team, look, you guys have come through all of this together. You've been successful. Uh, some of the old stuff that we use, like you said, about the parking spots, it's no longer relevant or functional in the way that it once was. You, you all take some time. You, you take some time to um, plan out what the future of this team is going to be. And, and then you bring that to us and, and you build the reinforcing behaviors, celebrations, events around it. I, I think that's something that's just naturally evolving in a few of our teams right now. 
Uh, we've we brought a number of our teams together through the pandemic. So some of them are only just getting the first chance to meet each other in person too. And it seems to be where I see the most energy. I, I see these people saying, hey, I've been a professional for 20 years, but I've never been given this opportunity to write my playbook. So writing it and celebrating the playbook of, of how they're going to operate as teams, I think that's really powerful. That's awesome. You, you could do the three rights. So people get to write W-R-I-T-E and they have the right, the R-I-G-H-T, to have the right, the R-I-T-E, to have that playbook. That's cool. I mean, that's super cool. You know, that is that, cool. And I love three. So love the three rights, I'm stealing that. All three. Yeah. Put it in there. I, I, I love it. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy for you to have that. I mean, how empowering for people. <laughs> and then to, to let people choose their celebrations, because there's so much stuff in the world that's just sort of in, an inherited belief or legacy of how we use our time. And of yeah. course, it's wonderful to celebrate birthdays and things like that. And yet, you know, if we can say, wow, this is the first time we're coming together physically. How do we want to craft a memory that restores us when we're back separate and doing Zoom or whatever it is we have to do? Because that is the future yeah. of the human race. You know, if we're successful in space travel, we better get pretty darn good yeah. at transmitting our love and compassion to people through a camera. Yeah, we, we must. It's funny. It's funny you mentioned that. I mean, I see in our future a big part of what we need to bridge in teams is actually not only team members as people, but team members as machines too. Yes. I'm not necessarily saying a robot, but how do our teams play with technology? The digital experience of how we interact as humans has never been more important. And there's so many brilliant solutions out there, but it's so fragmented. It's so hard to to pick the right path mm. um, and and in some ways it's it's on one hand liberating and empowering to have these technologies and on the other hand it's overwhelming and daunting um, if you what, what have you seen you've managed some fairly distributed uh, teams across companies that you've worked with what have you seen that's that's kind of pointing towards some better practices in teamwork between people and tools and processes? Well, better practices for teams and tools and processes. So one of them is, you know, I am privileged to be the granddaughter of a telegraph operator. My grandmother wore roller skates and she, you know, was like the Lillian Tomlin and plugged the thing in for, for Bell. Um, my dad saw himself as a communicator and the island I grew up on, I don't know what it was like in some of the rural places you lived in Australia, but we had a party line, you know, and you had to listen to the phone to see if somebody was on it. So that's how old I am. <laughs> and, and so for me, I, I really feel like, you know, the future of work is the future and the future of work is knowing how to learn and unlearn. So let's look, let's look at technology. Actually, you know, Brett, my husband and I were walking last night and there's some things now that I'm better at than him in terms of technology. And he used to say, hey, babe, I thought you were kind of a Luddite back then and now maybe it's me. <laughs> so there's, there's a way where uh, for me um, and being someone who has visioned uh, a digital platform, which I never, you know, thought I'd do, I play the game of making friends with technology. Uh -huh. I... I and literally, let me just show your viewers. So, so here's my phone. There was a day where I would go, oh, the phone, it wants to upgrade again. And, oh, it's a problem. No, this phone saves my life. This phone is good and I have choice around this phone. This computer I'm grateful for. So there's a way where people can use what I would even call practical spiritual practices to uh -huh. welcome processes and machines into their teamwork. You know? Yeah. I'm not beyond naming things. I really feel like having a relationship and a bond with the equipment that you use, whether it's a knife or a hammer or a computer in a team, is valuable because a craftsman uh, really yeah. honors his or her tools. So that's one view on it. And then the last thing I'd say about it, before we look at just some practical stuff people can do, is there's a proverb, I believe it's a Chinese proverb that says, that which does not learn becomes food for that which does. So if yes. you need a little, you know, kick in the 
patootie, learning, like I don't get to be 61 and say, ah, I'm going to relax. Yeah. I, it's like, okay, it's, a, it's time to learn, <laughs> you know? And, and the, the, there's, there's a couple of things that that just excites me about. Um, not only in some of the things that we're doing in our business, but some of the problems we're trying to solve more uh, globally right now in industry. And, and that is, and, and it keeps this theme of, of democratizing, giving agency, giving power to the individuals that use the tools. And I, and I think that that's what excites me because to your point, you can name it, you can have a spiritual connection with it. Um, you can be responsible for your learning, but also let's be honest, there's AI and machine learning. Now you're helping the machines learn too. So there's this symbiotic nature there and it, it's a, it's a fan, it's a fantastic theme of, um, going back to that craftsman example that you use, how do we create this energy between ourselves and the people we work with and the tools that we share? That, that really takes us to places that we hadn't yet thought of. Mm -hmm. and, and I think I think that excites me. That makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up <laughs> um, because we do that right. And, you know, people are going to be able to drive innovation and social impact and just great human connection from every layer of the organization and from every level of community. And that's that's really exciting to me. Yeah, uh, let me just comment on a couple of things on that that could be fun. Uh, Brett, my husband, gave to my mom, who's about to turn 90, uh, the book by Henry Kissinger and Eric Schmidt about AI. And so she's been reading it and we talk now and then she's like, oh my God, that is like frightening stuff. And one of, one of the things I said to her now this it has yet to be substantiated. This is one of my assertions for the future and something that my future self has talked to me about. I wanna go down in history as, you know, one of the women that the computers just love. You know, if it does come yeah. down to a robot attack, I want them to say, you know yeah. what? I wanna save Suzanne Conrad and her whole family because all they've ever done is be thoughtful and kind to us. And see, I feel like if I, extend my humanity to all things, there's a benefit to that because that's my team. That's team planet. Yeah. And, and uh, I have also had the privilege of having an incredible teacher who, who shared with me that really everything that we invent, you know, whether it's a filter in a cell phone or uh, mm -hmm. a, a quantum computer, it's a reflection of some aspect of our own humanity. And the more we can recognize that and be in wonderment with that and in wonder of that, I believe we'll enhance our chances of avoiding the matrix. Oh, and what else did I yeah. watch? Moon, what's that one? Moonfall. I was like, oh my God, that's a dystopic story. We're all going to die. <laughs> but I, I, I believe it's something that we can be excited about and recognize that there's a place for us to extend human love. Now, do I know exactly what that'll look like? No. Am I willing to experiment on that? Absolutely. Experimentation. That's, I think that is the key and we can make it safe for lots of people to experiment. I love that concept. I'm the woman that the machines love. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's so apt and it's so necessary. It's more than just a a legacy statement, an ego piece. I think it's important. I think the machines need to learn who here right now and who in our future is really um, capturing the essence of what it is to be human and how teams work together. Because let's be honest, people talk about this singularity event when the machines, the AI reaches parity with human intelligence and then they're going to beat us. So um, we've, we really do need to give them some good role models, give them some people that, that show them uh, an excitement for what it is that's been our history and what it is that, that could be our combined and shared future. Yeah. You know, um, our eldest son uh, went to law school on a NASA scholarship and he has wow. a specialty in understanding space waste and the possible future of um, treaties for the management of space. Because right now there isn't yeah. any law 
that that manages it. And I I point to that because I when this was years back when I went to his graduation and he introduced me to his space law professor, I said, "What is the operating theory currently of the work that you know you teach in law school?" And she said, "You know, we draw a lot." from the work of Gene Roddenberry and Star Trek to really understand and look at what would a confederacy look like? What are some of the things we need to do to be dealing with the environment around planet Earth? And so when you talk about a, a singularity event, I believe that there's a way where we have used the devices of the future self through science fiction to help us have reflective processes to see, well, okay, you know, George Orwell, 1984 wasn't as bad as he thought, you know. And we have the wonderful characters that the work extended, you know, through the various generations of Star Trek show us through some of the characters that are, of course, artificial intelligence and their pursuit of excellence and self-expression. So, you know, if it's going to happen, bring it on. Why be afraid? Let's embrace it. I, and I... <laughs> We need to do this over a drink next time because okay. we could be spending hours on this topic. <laughs> but uh, something again, something you just said, you know, there's all these gems today. I'm sure there's always gems with you, Suzanne. But um, the the concept of fiction, science fiction, actually makes this whole future of teamwork, I'm going to bring it back to that, so much more accessible to everyone because it's making, talk about making it safe to experiment. Let's tell a story about the future. Let's tell a story about what we want and how technology could be used. And, and then let's build towards that if we get enough consensus that it's a good idea, there's enough people that want it. It's, telling stories is safe. We haven't invested dollars. We haven't left a job. We haven't been constrained to only working with people that we know. It, it, Storytelling is such a huge thread through human civilization, human culture. And I, I think it has a big role to play in teams of the future and how we share our stories. You've, you've coached me a lot on that, telling more of our stories and, and our energy and our connections and then finding those other people out there, whether it's at work or in the community. I mean, teams don't have to all be employed by one employer anymore either. There's, there's, a, lot, there's a lot of energy. There's a lot of creativity, I think, we can flush out through story. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I know that you're on the forefront of helping people create and tell the story of building teams of people that are from different companies and how much like the creation of a film, people come together for a project and have specific roles and goals and they coalesce those. And that's just a wonderful, wonderful thing for people to be able to have, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people don't have it. Let's be honest. There's you and I have taken a lot of energy out of our careers. We still do. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people that don't have meaningful work. You, you mentioned it earlier. And maybe the way to <clears throat> start moving them in the direction of meaningful work and, and understanding where they may find it in the future is, you know, yes, you've got to pick up a tool and work in the field 12 hours a day, but it doesn't stop you from doing some of this storytelling, this, this imagination work to say, this is where I'd like it to be. Could this be a possibility? That, that's only 10 or 15 minutes here or there that could, could start something um, while they're still in a day job that, that may not be necessarily giving them a lot of opportunity for innovation and change now. Um, yes, they're doing brilliant work and they're helping companies achieve great things, some of these folks, but they're not really being given the time to to go through their three rights, you know, to write their playbook. They have to do business in a certain way because they're working in a hazardous or a high-risk environment mm -hmm. or, or a high-velocity, high high-production environment. So there's, I think there's some little tricks, some little tools that we can all start to wrap our arms around that, that allow people to realize that they can experiment, that they can start playing with stories, they can start visioning what, what that future might be for their teams and, and for their kids and, and for the businesses in their community. Yeah, I mean, let's let's talk about teams in highly regulated or, or hazardous environments because you do have teams yeah. in those and, and I've I've worked in those environments. One of one of the things that I've seen be really successful uh, for myself in finding meaning in that kind of work when when we're on the prevention side you know, having the meticulousness and the integrity to do the checklist correctly, 
because it's really about protecting or saving someone from a negative future. That, that's what it's always yes. about. So it's always about, for me, the game I would play is like seeing who I'm helping and protecting, even if I don't ever meet them. Do you know what I'm saying? Like it just, it yeah. just brought meaning instead of it being like, oh, I have to do this OSHA thing. Or, you know, I got to get my hazmat placard on the truck or, you know, it's, 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 it's more of staying in the um, enlightened perspective of the larger why, you know, which uh, I'm sure Daniel Pink speaks of and Simon yeah. Sinek and, you know, just like they're all on it. They're all on it. And, and it's our role, I feel, as entrepreneurs, as employers of people to make sure that people get the opportunity to reflect on the why for them and then connect to the why in the team and in into the activity. Yep. Yeah. I think that's a really good way to put it. The sto- Again, it's using storytelling instead of someone telling their own story. I think what I'm hearing from you, Suzanne, is that companies' leaders need to do a better job of filtering that story down to all of their team members on why are we here? What are we serving? Mm-hmm. I know you mentioned Pink. Pink, uh, Dan Pink referenced on Friday at this conference, we were at a, a scientific study where they put iPads in front of chefs mm. who were making meals so that the chef could see the customer who they were making the food Aww. for. And, <laughs> and it works. There's science there. The, the chefs, you know, they're making a standard meal, but they make a better meal, a higher quality meal, presentation, taste, you name it when they see the customer that's going to eat their meal, we need that human connection. Oh, it's very important. I love important. that study. Okay. Oh, well, that, that, it's pretty fun. that really makes a lot of sense to me. And, and I'm glad someone designed it because, you know, I, was, I just would always make it up for myself. And now I have evidence. Woo. <laughs> You've got, I'll send it to you. Well, here's a fun example of something that isn't high risk, but it's more about how to deal with the mundane and, and create a, uh, you know, a, a future of teamwork that's spectacular. So, so for the average uh, educator that would be working on the floor of a Lululemon store, a lot of the actual physical work that you're doing is getting clothes from the dressing room and folding them again and, and putting them back out and doing all that kind of stuff. And, and so when I would be uh, coaching these folks, it, what we would do and some of your listeners may have read the book, uh, Chop Wood, Carry Fire, and it's about taking any ordinary daily activity and using it as a practice in mindfulness. So we would just mm-hmm. play these games about, can we fold and stay present? You know, can, can we uh, do it in a way that we're left honoring ourselves because we've done this beautiful job of folding the clothing? So it isn't about vanity. It isn't about... Um, you know, we've got to have it right for the guest. It's really more about a, an expression of self. Uh, and, and, yes. and there's many books written about how when we take the mundane that isn't necessarily, you know, risky or hazardous and let it be elevated, then that eight hour day somehow flew because we were in more of that flow state of an optimal um, mindset. So that's that's another yeah. practice that I'd offer to people who are like, oh, another day of sweeping or whatever it is they got to do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think flow is important. Going back to that old world craftsman, my grandmother's boyfriend, Ooh. which sounds really new age. I love that. Um, he Wonderful man, uh, Colin. And Colin was a New Zealand born master uh, cabinet maker and wood carver so he would be able to carve all the beautiful floral designs onto the cabinets that he would make you name it he could build it and as life went on he was not able to find an apprentice because to be an apprentice in an art form like carving wood and, Mm. and making these fine cabinets you you need to spend a lot of time doing some very mundane tasks some of them were sweeping floors that's what reminded me of some of colin's stories i think it was a seven-year apprenticeship back in the day wow um where you're not getting paid a lot of money and yes you're you're doing some basic tasks but when you see the work of a craftsman like colin and and just the self-expression in that work uh and the, the the honoring of himself and those that have come before him to come up with some of the designs that he's building to there's there is a, a huge sense of um 
accomplishment flow. There's a lot that comes from that. And it's so sad we're losing skills and teams that are able to, to produce that type of work right now. Hopefully, you know, through, through some of these, uh, as you called it, a game or through some of these practices, we can find our way back to uh, some of those lost arts as well. well let's, let's go there for a moment if we have the time. Yeah. Um, first of all, there should be some company that you create sometime in your future called My Grandmother's Boyfriend. Love I mean, it. Done. Be, <laughs> uh, uh, Brett, Brett came up with the name because we were hanging some art of uh, the, the, the critical screw. I thought that could also be a good brand name. But anyway, to mastery. So uh, the other day I, I was doing a session on um, the future of work that, that's on YouTube. And we talked about how part of the future of work, and I'll say teamwork, is mm -hmm. art. Because, you yes. know, if you look at the work of Seth Godin, he'll say that what's completely irreplaceable is the artist in us. And where can we bring artistry to anything and everything that we do? There's an artistry in teamwork and in balancing yeah. the chemistry of a team and of testing a team. So for uh, your grandmother's boyfriend, when I look at the goals of this next generation, when I go through Lightyear and look at the, you know, thousands of goals and profiles that have been built there. So, so Lightyear is similar to LinkedIn in that instead of who you've been, it's about who you're becoming. There are many goals about people becoming master craftsmen. It is on the yes. rise along with regenerative farming, uh, things that are from that time. So I think yep. we're going to see uh, a resurgence in apprenticeship. Certainly some of the things that I do have required apprentices because you just need a lot of time watching yes. how someone approaches a conversation, a group. Um, how do you diagnose the ill uh, in a team and quickly be able to see what the elements could be to restore balance and that that takes apprenticeship so i i love it i love colin it does <laughs> yeah colin's a legend actually i've got to go and see him again before too okay, long okay well make sure he um, listens to this podcast you know? i will i'll send it to him <laughs> oh my i'll send goodness. it to him but apprenticeship and craft like you say there's people moving back towards regenerative farming there's people who are retiring and and picking up some of these crafts as a hobby mm -hmm. um it is really interesting. I think the role that it plays in teamwork, and I'd like to hear a little bit more about uh, light year leadership. I think there's this theme in businesses right now and in good teams where we support each other to embrace what's meaningful, not just in the workplace, yes. what's meaningful outside of the workplace. Yes. So I, I see it right now in our business that it's incumbent upon us to invest in what's meaningful to our teams. If that team really wants to go on a hike together, great. We need to find a way to contribute and support that. If that team has individuals that have a passion or a hobby around food or live music or playing music, how do we, how do we bring that? How do we connect the company goals and the personal goals in, in good teams? Because I think it's all part of the fabric. Um, you just mentioned with, with your uh, software platform, uh, Lightyear, that, that you're doing a lot of work in goal setting and, and, and sort of journey mapping almost for people as individuals. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, uh, what, what folks do is they can take either a, a, a shorter course called Power My Future, which they could do self-led or they could come onto a workshop. And it helps people have the primary tools of being able to create a vision and then work backwards. So they begin by... Uh, just to give you all information now, instead of having to go there, you could draw a circle and we call that the power of knowing what you want. And you write what you want on the inside and what you don't want on the outside. And then you start to see how you could take what you want and talk to that future self and create a vision. Well, this is what it feels and sounds like 10 years from now. You author that and then you work backwards from that vision Instead of with the struggles and restraints of time and money and resources from here, you start from there and yeah. work backwards. Now, how that's important to teams is something as simple as there's a, a GM of a, a, a large set of restaurants that uses Lightyear for all of their folks. And 
this one individual, I, I was looking at his goals and he has a goal to, uh, by time why, you know, to have all the dishes in his kitchen be pottery that he's made. Wow. And so now when I see him or interact with him, I ask him how that project's going. So it gives us that small but meaningful place that he's authored. It's his playbook. I didn't tell him, hey, dude, go go become a potter, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But it gives, it gives me this intimate window. So I feel like when teams know at least some of the basic personal career and health goals of one another, it provides this uh, basket or this container that allows them to become closer. It gives them a way to be more aware of the larger realm. And that yeah. is newer. You know, when I was first working, um, you know, you didn't really talk about your personal life. That and if you did, it was just remembering names of kids, right? It was, it was I don't want to say lip service, but it was a little bit too formulaic mm. where what you're suggesting is we really get to know where this person's going, what's meaningful to them, and, and we get to talk about what's meaningful to them rather than just running through the formula, how's the kids, how's the wife, how's the husband, how's the dog? Yeah. You know, it, it, there's a lot more, there's a lot, again, fabric. There's a lot more fabric to that. And, and I can also think of a, an instance just this week where um, a young woman who's recently had her, her second child, she's an entrepreneur, um, so she's in one of those moments you talked about earlier that's challenging. And she's about yeah. to maybe give up or rewrite her vision because she just can't quite see how that'll happen. And I was encouraging her to stay the season before she does a rewrite because there will be times in yeah. our life when a team member reminds us to remember the future we authored because in the moment it's like, oh God, that just looks too hard. Who was I to think yeah. that? And, and it's the team then that holds the vision steady while the person puts the things in place and, you know, comes out of postpartum and then goes, right. Yeah. I do want that. Yeah. So that go ahead. <laughs> that's a whole nother level. I think I'm trying to, I like to draw a map or a diagram for all of this stuff, but right now I'm trying to show all of these reinforcing elements. And I, I love the fact that the team can be responsible for supporting an individual to achieve their future self in the same way that the individuals are responsible for the team to create its future self in business. There's a, there's a, there's a really interesting um, energy, sim, sort of symbiotic nature to that relationship, mm -hmm. um, which I, I'm excited to explore that more. I know you and I talked about doing my... Uh, uh, light year profile and hopefully we can build that out with a few more of the team here and really really play with it really experiment I think there's a lot of value there and it'll be interesting to uh, learn those things and what's fascinating about it is so using you as an example Dane as you author your playbook and your future self and write your goals it's the things that you want me to know so there could be things that you keep yeah. private, of course, but these are the things that people, like, it's good to have people know. All right, I, I'd, I'd love to find property in Wyoming, or I'd love to take my children on, on an adventure where we go to the Antarctic. You know, I'm making up stuff, but like, whatever it is, yeah. then it's you revealing that, and then I can be supportive of it. So it's essentially giving you the key ingredient of the future of teamwork, which is free will. Because there's really no, no stick and uh, big enough and no carrot orange enough to replace yeah. the intrinsic power of a person's choice, you know? Yeah. That's the engine that's, of the team. It is the engine. I think that, that's, that's the engine and probably the gas. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if people are there for their free will. Yeah. Um, you've got a lot of horsepower and you can, you can put a lot out. It's way more output. than the paycheck. Or the punishment. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and look, to everyone listening now that's in that situation, that will be dissolving and evolving in your lifetime. Yes. It, it, it will be for almost yep. every role. Uh, and it'll take time and it'll take consciousness and it'll take new processes. So, yeah. Um, but going back to one of your early points, it's... That's the call to action, isn't it? It's, it's put the time into it. It's caused that 
future for yourself and for your team that that you deserve mm -hmm. i think that's really that that's huge i mean we've spoken through only half an hour or so so many great topics i mean my takeaways the three rights i thought that was fantastic i'm definitely stealing it Steal um, like an artist I, dane <laughs> it's all I, yours <laughs> i loved where you went with with the storytelling the science fiction you know learning from star trek and and into the it, from the storytelling into some of the games and positioning you know uh, yourself to kind of honor yourself and and represent yourself in tasks like folding clothes that's huge and and uh thirdly the, the concept of using a platform like lightyear to really build out your story for yourself for your future self where you're going and to share that with people who can help you achieve that that's there's so much power there's so much excitement that i think comes from that 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 people deserve right now so um all of that plus you gave me a freebie which is start a business called my grandmother's boyfriend there's <laughs> don't you don't so you want to buy something to from head. that company i'm yeah. like what is he gonna yeah. sell i mean i don't know i feel like it needs to have a shop front i'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna keep playing on that i mean uh, such a good conversation suzanne and thank you so much for for joining me today and uh for being a, a friend and a partner to Huddle 3 Group. I'm, I'm really excited to what uh, we can achieve together and through our companies Lightyear and Huddle 3 Group as we go forwards into the future of teamwork. Well, thank you so much for inviting me and for allowing me to um, express some of the things that I feel are important in this time. And you did such a beautiful job of recapping and I am excited to see what we'll get to create in our future as well. So thanks so much, Dane.